Welcome to Running For Real, a global community with a shared love and curiosity for running. Together we reconnect with the reasons why we love to run and discover ways it helps us become better people. Whether it's the quiet moments of a morning run while the rest of the world still sleeps, or befriending the strangers next to you at the start line of a race. We are here to connect with others who see running as the common thread that weaves our lives together. Come join me, Tina Muir, as I talk with people from all walks of life, united by a love of running. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 346 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm excited that you are here and so appreciative that you have chosen to join Running For Real today. I know there are many places you could spend your time. I know that you could be listening to running or otherwise you could be listening to music, whatever. You are here and I am so appreciative of that. And I have a very special guest today on the show who I'm excited to welcome you. Uh, Diane Nakiri is on the show today. Diane competed for Burundi as a 15-year-old in the 2000 Summer Olympics in Sydney. You're going to hear a little bit about that. She also competed in the 2012 Summer Olympics and in London in the marathon. Uh, she's the Burundian record holder in too many events for me to <laughs> name. There's so many, but she's now a US citizen and is we're talking about the next stage of her journey and that's not to say that she stepped away from professional running she is very much doing it but also we wanted to talk a little bit about what it would be like or what or what it can be like to continue your running journey to know that maybe you could get back to the point that you were running at your fastest uh, but everything would need to line up and it's okay if it doesn't this is really a conversation about looking bigger than running recognizing what you have beyond running and what you should appreciate beyond running um diane you're going to hear her talk about in this episode um she fled um from her home uh country of burundi to toronto seeking asylum uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that and much more so let's get to this episode with diane i know you're going to love her as much as i do let's get to it Thank you to AG1 from Athletic Greens for sponsoring the Running For Real podcast and for supporting me with the work that I'm doing. They recently were, uh, they funded the Red S rec recovery resource that I created, which I really appreciated. And they just care about the community. So I wanted to start by highlighting that. But what is AG1? Well, AG1 allows you to take control of your health, give your body what it truly needs. And now there's one serving of AG1 delivers this high impact blend of nine health products multivitamin, minerals, probiotics, adaptogens, and more that is designed to support your gut health, support recovery, energy, boost, and more. So everything we need as runners. As a friend of mine, you can get a one-year free supply of vitamin D3 plus K2, another critical component we need, need as runners, as well as from keeping us healthy from getting sicknesses. Plus, you're going to get five free travel packs with your order. So when you are traveling to races, you can have those with you. I do not miss days of Athletic Greens. And if I do... I notice it and I miss it and I crave it when I get home. So I have so easily slipped this into my routine. It is the one habit that I am actually able to keep. And I know that it's taking care of my gut health, my immunity, my energy, and my recovery. Those are all things we as runners need. It's got 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients in one serving. And it tastes really good. It's almost got like a pineapple-y flavor to it. Um, my kids love it. And if a two-year-old and a five-year-old love it, that is saying something. So you can go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to get that special offer as a friend of mine. Go check out AG1. You will see that the hype is for real. The reasons are, are true and um, you're going to love it. I know I do. Diane, I am excited, although this is long overdue, to welcome you to the Running For Real podcast. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. It's funny, uh, for the listeners, uh, we recently connected. We've been kind of messaging back and forth for a little while. And um, I told you uh, last time we spoke on the phone that I was, <laughs> that you, I mean, you remember this too, but like, I we met each other in 2015 at Bix, which is this seven mile, is yes. it seven mile, yep. seven mile race in I. Uh, where was it in Iowa? Davenport, Iowa. Davenport. Yeah, mm -hmm. we met at this race, and I remember you sit. We were all sitting at this table the day before in these little like 
dorm buildings that we were staying in. And I remember um, us all sitting at this table and I just felt so intimidated by you because you just seemed so cool. Like you just had this like, you felt, it felt to me like you were one of these people that just people were drawn to you. And you were just like the life, the life of the room and the one that lit up the room. And I, even yeah. though we were outside and I, I told you this already, but like, I remember being so intimidated and thinking like, oh, she doesn't know who I am. She probably thinks I'm some like little, uh, like wannabe elite that's like here. And so, um, it's funny, you know, now you and I are connected. And as I told you, so many people have told me how amazing of a human you are. So this is long overdue. But I'm gonna. Bar- I just wanted to embarrass you once again on the spot and say how intimidated I was by you yeah. in that moment. Well, thank you. And also, I never, uh, you know, meet a person and say, "Oh, you want to be Nelly," unless all you talk about is running and you're obnoxious. Mm. We usually, I'm usually cool. I feel like with people, it just takes some time. But I see, I can see how, you know, you might think, "Oh my gosh," maybe because I'm tall. I always think it's because I'm tall. It, I mean, it might have been a little bit, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I've got like, what do they call it, like short person syndrome or something, where you like are kind of nervous around people who are taller because they kind of have this kind of uh, confidence about them. I don't know. No, yeah. I don't think that is the case. But um, anyway, I am so glad that we are connected here today. And you and I are going to have a bit of a different conversation to, I think, what you've done in the past with other podcasts, but also what people might expect Because despite you being, having achieved incredible um, things as a runner, you're still competing at the professional level. Um, Your journey has taken some twists and turns. And um, I think we want to go deeper than what it might seem in terms of comparing yourselves to to the past. Mm -hmm. Um, Thinking about what is good and bad about our running journey. And um, and yeah, so I think this is going to be a little bit different, but I want to begin as we, as we do with some moment in your life that was a realization, an epiphany that in a roundabout way has led you to this moment right now. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think when I left home in uh, 20, no, not 2001, um, I had already been competing, I think for a bit, two years, I was like 16 years old. And I think when I was packing my bags and knowing that I I wasn't going to come home in like two weeks and Mm -hmm. I was just going to, you know, just go out there and go to Canada and trust that everything is going to be okay and pack my big bags and say bye to my family, especially my mom. And I was like, well, this is it. So that was really not, um, turning back. And at that point, I think my life was already like had changed, but I also knew that it was going to change whether it was going to be good or bad, but I knew but with like making that decision was at 16, like this is going to be good for me. It's going to change my life and it's going to change my family. Life. And was that, that was your decision kind of exclusively? Or was this something you and your mom had talked about? Um, it was more, yeah. Well, my mom, definitely did not want me to do it. It was more mm. like she knew I was going to do it because I talked, you know, my brother, my older brother, the one actually who lives um, in Maryland where I am right now. Um, mm-hmm. He is the second oldest and he was always being like more understanding and they were supportive and all my siblings were supportive. But I think when my dad passed away, I was nine years old and he took the role more of like, a brother slash, um, you know, dad. So I think mm. I've always like trusted that, like, you know, talking to him about the decision or him telling me you can do it. So I felt more comfortable and, and I knew that mom didn't really want me to go because she was worried about me and I was young. And I think that every mom feels that way about their kid, even when yeah. they're older than 16. So I also knew that eventually she would understand and then she definitely did. So it was more like a family decision, but mostly my brother and I, and then my, my mom being like, well, you know, I just wanted him to her to sign the paperwork and because she signed it. So I figured at least like certain percentage, maybe at least 30% of her thought, okay, this will be okay. Mm. 
And I want to add some more details. I did mention some of this in the in the intro, but um, this was having competed in the 2000 Sydney Olympics, um, and you were 15 for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's correct. Um, and then you came back and you were seeking asylum um, from the Burundi civil war. Mm -hmm. um, was it something during the games like, or being at the games that made you think this is what I've got to do? This is why I've got to do it. This is the time is now. Like, why was it that coming back from the games time that made you decide this is what I need to do? Yeah. I mean, a little bit, I think even going to the Olympic games, I really had no idea what it really meant. So it was more like mm. just seeing that like millions of other people, you know, from different, different sports, were maybe some of them doing it just to go to represent their countries and maybe um, it kind of maybe changed their life in a way. Maybe their life was better. I mean, for me, just being able to travel, like from being a village, you know, kid to traveling to Australia where none of my, you know, my neighbors were even going to the capital mm -hmm. city. So I went from being not even going to the capital city to like, you know, traveling by airplane. So for me, it was like, since I had already been to France and Belgium and other countries before the game. So, so I was already like starting to realize like, wow, this is like a thing. So it was a combination of like that last, those, that year, plus the Olympic games. And then also knowing that I'm going to the Francophone games in Canada and knowing that I had a cousin in Canada and all their extended family there. So I was like, well, if they're in Canada and they're still living there, there must be a life there. So it was more mm -hmm. like also seeing how unstable my country was. And I've also seen a lot like going from my village to the city where there was a lot of, you know, shooting people that were shooting from the forest. If you take a bus, if I've seen a dead body, a guy who was shot and killed in my, in my bus. And that was scary. I like 15, 16 experiencing that. I was like, I knew it wasn't safe and in order for me to keep doing this. I knew that, since I had that opportunity to be able to travel and also having all my siblings in a village and my mom being single and it wasn't easy. It was just tough to kind of just go by and, and find money to go to school, school fees. My mom had to like, I don't know, we had to sell like our crops and stuff. And it was just hard because it's not like expecting mm -hmm. like money to come at the end of the month. My mom didn't work. She was a farmer. So it was hard. It was more like, what can I do? For me, my life to get better and also being able maybe bit to help my family so my mom doesn't have to stress about every single month about, you know, school fees. Mm. With all that going on, when you went to the Olympics and all these other places where you traveled to run, did at times that feel kind of frustrating with how, did it feel like that made things meaningful or did it make at times things things feel very like this is just running or this is people are getting so worked up about these races because they don't really have anything else to stress about. Like, did you struggle with that in terms of the perspective of what you had compared to these other people you're competing against who the most stressful thing they're dealing with is like, they forgot their pre-race sandwich. And so they're having to buy a sandwich in the store, you know, yeah. how did you handle that? Um, when I was 15, 16, I didn't even know that was like a, a thing. I didn't know you had to eat an oatmeal or a bagel before a run. For me, I just ate what I, what was there. I didn't even think, mm. I didn't really overthink. For me, it was like, I, I don't even think I knew what other people were going through because I didn't, one, I didn't mm. speak English. I didn't speak, I didn't really interact with a lot of people, but I just kind of learned as I was in high school and college and I just, even now, now I think about it now, like that I'm, you know, I live in America, I have a stable life, I can travel, I can do whatever I want. But sometimes when I'm on a run with a friend and they're complaining about something so small, I always think about when I was younger and the people in my village or the people that I know that I don't even have even opportunity. And I'm always like, I, I don't want to like sound mean and be like, man, like your problem is like literally like nothing compared to what other people are going through. You know how we always like, we have the saying as like, oh, you think you go, you know, you're having like the worst day, but there's always somebody who can't even walk. It was in a wheelchair. It was never even going outside. I have a, one of my friends, 
who is really sick. And I think when she started getting sick, she was in her 20s and now she's in her 30s. And it's been, I've known her now for eight years. She lives in Flagstaff and she barely goes outside. And then whenever I'm out there complaining about the snow and the cold, I'm always like, I also think about people that can't do it. Not that you don't have the right to complain, but sometimes I'm just like, man, these people are crazy. So I think about it more <laughs> now versus back then, but I never even had the time. I didn't have time to complain and think about what I have to eat, um, what I have to do in the morning. I think I got more, maybe more problems and start complaining as I get older because I'm around people who are somehow sometimes negative mm-hmm. and about the nonsense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just excited yeah, I- to be out. I'm sure. I'm sure. This um this morning actually, I I woke up and my uh, two year old like climbed into the bed with me, and I was lying there, and the window was open, and I could see the sun coming up, and I could hear the birds, and I thought to myself, this is amazing that I'm alive right now. Like I'm looking at these trees with the sun, I can hear the birds, I'm like comfortable and warm. It the window is open. And it was so funny because for the most part, I don't think about that. Like I don't wake up in the morning and think, I'm so glad to be alive. Mm-hmm. But, you know, because for most of the time, at least for most people listening, I would imagine we we don't think about these little things mm-hmm. that um, we just, <laughs> it sounds, you know, trivial, but we we should be appreciative of that are just simple gifts of being literally one in however many million of being in on this earth right now and um yeah so I often think about the just the perspective shift of sometimes we get so wrapped up in in life that we don't um, Mm. slow down to to just be in the moment of where we're at um and uh so you weren't aware of it while you were uh in that experience. And you said there that sometimes you're on a run and you'll recognize it, but how else do you keep that within you of your perspective? Like you said, you live here. So you're surrounded by this and American life and all the, you know, paperwork and, and things that have to be done over here. How do you keep your perspective um, as you've moved through life as an adult? Um, I think I always remember my upbringing, like honestly, like, how I grew up and yeah, we didn't have a lot, but we were just really happy people. Like we, I get along with all my siblings. I, and it's also, it's all work. Like, I mean, to keep a good relationship with like friends and family, like it is a work, but also it's like, it shouldn't be that much work where you talking to someone and you're not happy. And obviously that's not a good person to talk to, even if it's a sibling. So I think just, just make myself a just being an invite in an environment where I feel loved and supported mm. and also knowing that like yeah like I I get stressed um when I have to do paperwork um I'm more sometimes a last minute person I'm not a planner because I feel like planning so much also stresses me out so for me mm. like, when I need to get things done I get it done no matter what and sometimes I'm like man I could have made that so much easier for me Life is not easy, but also it's like, I also enjoy not doing anything. And when I get it done, I always feel like at the end of the day, for me, I'm like, I get it done no matter what. And, and it's okay not to always live in the moment because if I just sat down and thought about, oh, my life used to be so hard. Now I have a really good life. And I kept thinking about every good things that I've done. Then I won't even get anything done in the next couple of years. You know, it's always like, Mm. yeah, like I know that even if I lost everything I have now, I could start all over again. And then actually there's no a job that I cannot do. There's not a place yeah. I can't leave. So I always think like, no matter what happens, I can lose everything I have and then I can start over again. So I'm never really freaked out by that. And of course I don't want to lose everything that I have, but I never say, Oh, if my house burned down, it would suck. Yeah. But I can start over. I can work at McDonald's. I can clean people's home. So that's what, for me, I always like, even if I become like, I get all this money and in the future and I get, it doesn't really matter to me. Like, it's nice to have that because then I can help people. I can help my family. I can live a good life. I can travel, but, but also it's okay if I lose it all. Same with running. Like I love it. 
it's gotten me to so many places. It's changed my life, but I also am okay without it. Having been around a lot of professionals, do you think that's quite a rare way of looking at your running? Of yeah. like, I, yeah, I, I love it. I appreciate it, but I'd be okay without it. Yeah. And I think that had you asked me maybe 10 years ago, I wouldn't be saying this. I mean, it comes with like, mm. um, experience and, um, what also how I grew up. I think the biggest thing and the reason why I can't, you know, if you just like tell me, Oh, this is how I feel about running. My relationship with running is healthy and unhealthy. Sometimes like, it's not like I judge you. I just kind of feel like it is your background. I don't know how you were raised. For me, if I'm out running in my village, people think I'm crazy. They don't understand the whole running thing. So like, it's it's it was never about running. It was never when it came to like fueling or eating. I've always loved eating with my family. Like for me, I always say like food is life. I never had any type of you know relationship that was unhealthy with food because that's what I did. Even until today, I'm aware that I have to eat healthy. I have to maintain a certain type of body to run because you know when you're running if you like heavier it doesn't feel good you're not you're not in shape so you, to do what we do we have to get to a body where we feel strong and comfortable but it doesn't mean we stop eating like you know or when I'd imagine not, that you're f- go on you finish no yeah so it's it, for me it's like i don't ever like so whenever i talk to people here and they tell me how they do things i'm always like whoa I never want the running to be, I never, I never want, I want to make, make sacrifices and compromise sometimes, but I, I don't think running is that important to the point where I'm going to drop everything that I love, like food, family, being, going to somebody's wedding that I love. Like I'm not, I've heard people talk about, oh yeah, like it's always like writing a letter to myself, right? The whole like young, if I were young, I'll write this. And these are like the most successful people. And they all have regrets. Not that I don't have any regrets, but my regrets has nothing to do with missing family events. And of course I wish I lived with like my mom and all that, but also I'm building my own life. You know, like I'm creating my own family too outside my family. That's just part of it. It's not like I'm miserable. I actually love what I do. And if I want to go back to live with my mom, I can pack my bag and leave. Thank you to Allbirds for sponsoring this episode of the Running For All podcast. And you have heard me talking about Allbirds, how I am wearing Allbirds pretty much 24-7. Okay, not when I'm inside the house. I'm not wearing them right now. But anytime I'm outside or doing something, I'm wearing Allbirds. I run in the tree flyers. I wear the tree dashes for most of my daily um, activities. When I was working at the Chicago Marathon, Uh, sorry, the Shamrock Shuffle, which is part of the group that puts on the Chicago Marathon. I was on my feet for 10 to 14 hours at a time. Those dashes were so comfortable. My feet did not hurt at all at the end of the day. I also love the plant paces. Those are kind of the the more fashion forward. um, They're made of plant leather, so they're not vegan, which is made of plastic. Um, And uh, those are my like kind of casual shoes. I also love the loungers for going out in the evenings. Pretty much everything I wear is Allbirds and you will see why when you head over to their website, you will see everything is beautifully made. It is sustainably made. They are obsessed with getting their carbon number down, which means the amount of um, carbon emissions that goes into each individual shoe. You will see there is a carbon number on each item, which means how many emissions are going into the atmosphere with each item they make. And the, the numbers that they get are pretty impressive with how low they are able to get them compared to other companies. So sustainability is at the core of this company and I absolutely love it. Now, as a friend of mine, you can get a free pair of socks with your order. You just need to add a pair of socks to your cart when you click the link in the show notes, Um, add a pair of socks and it will take them off when you use that link. Uh, tick off the price, I should say. Again, I want to recommend the tree flyers. Those are the ones I run with. I also recommend the tree dashes. Those are my day-to-day favorite Um, and the paces and the lounges. Those are the ones I want to talk about today. Go check them out. You can't really go wrong. Thank you so much to Allbirds for your support. Oh no, I, I love, I love that. I mean, but 
the thing is this is this is all going back to the most important thing right mm -hmm. it, which is like your relationship with yourself mm -hmm. and doing what you need to do to get by um that you trust yourself mm -hmm. to um eat what you want to eat and yes make you know good choices as much as you can but also forgive yourself if you don't and yeah. and live your life and um you and I were talking before we started recording about how um you know uh, we've been talking about something and I said to you that I feel like in many ways I've gotten too negative on the way that I viewed my, my career, uh, in that I, a lot of the time see the bad of it or the like things I was struggling with internally when there was so much good at the time. Uh, but again, a lot of that comes down to that. I didn't trust myself and I didn't see it was running was so much more than, just running mm -hmm. and you've been able to keep that uh approach that like um running doesn't have to be oh um I've got to get this out of myself and I need to make the most out of this and I have to skip my best friend's wedding because I've got a long run the next day but you have found that beautiful balance and you know I love hearing that because it means you don't have those regrets because you are yes running yes doing the best you can but also having a life outside of it that is meaningful and, and rich yeah yeah i mean i mean we all i'm sure there are like times where maybe five six eight years ago where running was going amazing and maybe i didn't like i wasn't living in the moment all the time right maybe i didn't see how amazing that race was but i also can go back and think about the races that i had and maybe the breakthrough of thinking about, I remember how I felt from the start to the finish because, you know, breakthrough races don't happen very often. Um, I always think about mm -hmm. the New York half in 2013 when I ran at PB and then I was, I think, second in the race. I felt so good that the last few miles I was running like 505, 508, and it felt like just me being out on the easy run. And so... Mm -hmm. Even at that moment, and I was very excited when I finished, and I still remember, and then it's been 10 years ago. But to me, like, that makes me, that brings me so much joy that I still remember that race from, like, beginning to the end because I feel like I was in the moment, but I'm not going to just dwell on that race and be like, I want that race again. I know it's going to, might never happen, right? So mm -hmm. if my career ends today, I'm like, well, I really, really enjoy that, and then, like, for example, on Sunday when I went running, Cherry Blossom 10-miler, like, I knew the work I put in. So, I mean, part of me wanted to be up front and be, like, compete with the win because it's just way more fun. There are, like, motorcycles and, you know, the press track. It's, like, exciting, and that is what it is, what we love to do. We love to compete. But it's also, like, wanting – it's, like, when you see someone with a big house, like, you know, a lot of money wanting that when you don't even know what they put, what they put, what, what work they do to get there. It's almost like me wanting to be up there with Sarah and other girls when I don't even know what Sarah put in the last six months. Maybe she sacrificed her whole life. Or oh, That's just an example. So why would I want to be up there up front when I know I didn't put enough work? So like, I think you just have to swallow your pride and be like, this is what I put in. And then this is probably what I'm going to get out of it. But also anything could happen. Some days you feel great. The chances of being up there if you didn't do workouts is really, really slim. So I think being realistic and also not use running for other, like you were saying, maybe it was more than running. Maybe it was mm. you use running to cope with something else. You know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. How maybe this is just something again with your upbringing again with just who you are, but I know a lot of people do get to races elite at the elite level or across the board, any, anyone where they get to a race, like where you said, cherry blossom and, um, they know they haven't done the work. They know that they, you know, miss things, skip things, couldn't do things, whatever. And there's a lot of guilt in terms of, I didn't do what I should have. Um, it, it makes the whole experience of that race negative because it's instead of it being a celebration, it's a like, Oh, I should have been up there. So how do you talk yourself through that? Did you struggle with that even before the race or were you just like very matter of fact with it? Like, yeah, you know, I, I did what I did and that's the reality. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's like the easiest thing to do, but I think if you don't really care what people, I mean, it's, hard, it's like saying, I don't care what people like think. I wouldn't say like a hundred percent. That's like true. Right. You always kind of, like, if somebody asks you, especially knowing that they're a professional one, right. And they ask you, are you fit? And for me saying, actually not. I mean, my name, it's my job. I should be fit, right? Especially if I'm going to come to a race, yeah. we are expected to be fit. But also, it's when you just have to be like, you know what? I don't care what you think. Like, I remember on Saturday, I went to this, like, a pre-race party where we just had to hang out with, like, the sponsors and stuff. I went there, and then they had six people, like, were there. And then they're like, are you fit? I'm like, nope. Are you healthy? I was like, yes. So it's like, that's where the people who pay me, right? But for me, it's like, pardon, maybe I should care more, but I want to be honest. I'm like, I am not fit, mm -hmm. but I also have a family. It's an excuse for me to be here. But I also don't want to think that people are inviting me that I'm taking advantage of the fact that they can pay for my ticket. I'm still going to be part of it. I'm still going to give my best. I think as long as I know that whatever I have coming in, I'm going to do everything I can, put everything out there. I have no guilt. And I also feel really confident that I don't care what so-and-so is thinking. I think as long as you're just doing it for yourself and you don't care what the other people think and you're okay with saying, Hey, I'm not fit. Even the other competitors were asking you, you, what's your plan? I was like, honestly, I have no idea. I'm just trying to hopefully find somebody to run with. That's usually means I'm not going to be up there fighting for the win and that's okay also. But you also, if you're not, comfortable with that that's the time when maybe you shouldn't race because then you're just gonna become more insecure you're gonna have a you're gonna be overthinking and it's probably not gonna be good for you i think you just have to know who you are and what you will care with yeah and for you is it taken you a long time to get to that place where you know having started at the olympics age 15 uh have you taken a journey to get to that point to where you can say, I'm just, I'm going to give my best for what I got today. Or has that always been the way you've been even as young as that? Um, I think it's both, uh, definitely like going through things like not in like basically in like running, but like going through life and just seeing even the ones who are breaking the world records, all this, it's just stories. You realize that nobody really cares if you win on, <laughs> We have a one on Sunday, like, yeah, that day you said it where you, you go, you know, you, you break the tape, but then you go home and then maybe you might post it on social media. People remember they'll congratulate you. Nobody cares really. Like, because first of all, you're not paying anybody's rent. That's what I always say. It's like, maybe your kids would know that you won something because you're going to bring money home or whatever, something, but for somebody else, they don't care. Like it doesn't really matter. So that's what I'm always like, well, I think it's better to just be nice because nobody cares if you won. Like you see people win the Boston marathon. Yeah. Like unless you, you like, when you're presenting that person, you say, Oh, the former, you know, Boston champ. And you, if you were out in the room, there's very going to be very few people who know that what you did, unless you're like sometimes being a running nerd, being in a running you know, industry, you know, but really nobody cares. Even for me, I forget, I'm like, okay, so you won. Good for you. It is impressive, but it's not something to brag about. So I think it's just more mm. like realizing that it doesn't really matter. There's nothing, you're not that special just because you're a good athlete or you're winning if you're not a good person. That's like, I mean, I know it's easy to say, but that's with the truth. So true. And, uh, I mean, we hear about this often in terms of, yeah, when you're coming to, you know, we come to the end of our life, we don't talk about people's PRs. We don't talk about what they accomplished. We talk about the kind of human they were underneath, the things that they did, the kindness they showed, the ways that they contributed um, to the community and the world around them. Uh, but it does, it, you know, it does easily become that thing that just feels like, um, yeah, everyone's watching you and um, everyone is, uh you know, wondering why you didn't do well if it didn't, if it didn't go well. Um, I want to just go back to, yeah, that 15 year old Olympian just one more time here um, in terms of when you were in that experience, were you able to, were you just 
kind of taking it in being in Sydney being all of this going on you know not speaking English so not you know being able to I mean I'm you know you could obviously talk to some other people that were there but not being able to take in what was going on in the what the stadium was announcing and all those things tell us a little bit about that experience in terms of how you handled that as a 15 year old um that had to be a lot of stimulation uh to go through yeah it was definitely like i feel like overwhelming and i think sometimes it helps when you don't know what's going on i didn't know a lot of runners i didn't know like what the olympics really meant i mean i knew the olympics but i don't think i knew the history and what it meant to be an olympian um and i think it's you know how like kids kids are just they don't know that when you're innocent, right? Like when you don't know what's happening, you just kind of go with it. So like with me, mm-hmm. I went with it. I went and did my race. Um, and then my teammates would maybe would Google look at, you know, watch another race. I'll go with them. I'll go with whoever wanted to go with me because I was young and I didn't know what I was doing. So I think I was probably more present than a lot of people because then I was just watching people. Right. Um, it's not like now where everything you get in a, you know, on a camera or social media, but I was actually like present, but I also had no idea what was happening and I was very overwhelmed. And I think when I went back home, I started remembering everything that happened at the Olympics and I was like, Oh, that makes sense. And then the following Olympics, I would watch the Olympic ceremony. I'm like, Oh yeah, I was holding that flag, you know, the opening ceremony. Mm. It just made me think of what had happened in 20 in 2000 and as i was in college and then i would hear stories of people that want to become olympians and i was like oh i'm not and i don't have to worry about that you know what i mean it's like not like to like yeah. and to me it wasn't like i thought i was important because i did it was more like oh it's like kind of like saying oh i want to go to watch that movie it's like i watched that movie for me it was like i've been there i've done that now it's time to go to college like college at one point it was more important than the Olympics because I never dreamed of it. Sure. Same, I never really yeah. dreamed of going to the Olympics either. So for me, like, even now, it's like when I got my real estate license, it was like, I got to get this. This is like exciting for me. Like, I think not that the real estate is the same as like Olympics, but it's a new experience. I got to learn and I got to meet different people. And it hasn't really changed for me. It's more like just embracing everything and knowing that it's going to be hard. But for me, it's just like, I don't know. I guess it's hard to explain, but I was very, I had no clue what was happening. Mm. When you got your real, when you start, is a license, is that the term? Is it a real estate mm-hmm. license? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, when you got your real estate license, um, was, did you find it difficult at all to, well, two things. One, like mentally shift to, I'm not, you know, running is now kind of secondary. I have something else that I'm, I'm focusing on. I'm excited about, I'm enjoying. And then secondly, like physically, was that now difficult to, to fit that in around your training? So how has that shift been having this new part of life to add? Yeah. I mean, I still think like running is like, still definitely my priority, but I also know like building a business is very hard, you know, especially for the first year. But it was nice because I've always wondered what I wanted to do besides running. And that definitely stressed me out because, you know, also I feel like every time I would go to a race, you know, now that I'm, you know, late thirties, people would be like, so what are you going to do if, when you're not running? And I feel like people just do it to rub it in your face that you're running. And I used to say, well, I went to college. I'll find a job. But it, honestly, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And when, when Abdi mentioned real estate, I was like, Hmm, I, okay. So I just started studying does, during does the pandemic. Does he do that as well? No, no. He's still running. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. He just um, mentioned it. He just mentioned it and said, oh, you, I think you'd be good. And I'm like, oh, okay. I just got the, over the book <laughs> and I took the class. It was during the pandemic. So it was kind of perfect because the pandemic kind of left all of us thinking, what do I want to do? Like, even I'm sure runners start questioning what they want to do. I mean, um, Abdi wrote a book and I was right, um, you know, studying for my real estate. And I think when I got my license, I knew it was going to be really hard because even just taking the test was really hard, but I feel so relieved. Like, cause sometimes you, I've been running for so long 
and being like a professional runner for 10 to 11 years while I'm doing anything else, it kind of, like, all you do is run. It's kind of, I wouldn't say it's good. You really, you don't realize you can do anything else. Like I always like, man, I don't know if I can do anything else. You start doubting yourself. So that was me. Mm -hmm. When I asked that this, especially for how hard it was, I was like, I could do anything. <laughs> so it made me I feel good. That. I had something else besides running. And I think that's why now I'm like also have the same mindset that I have. Like if his running is not working, it's okay. I can do other things. And I think it helps having something else. Well, you don't have to focus on just running and you can help. I mean, I can help clients and it's not, has nothing to do with running. Of course I could be like, this house is good because there's a trail for hiking. <laughs> I feel like I do bring a lot more. So like it, it actually makes me feel good and, and confident as well that I could do pretty much anything I want to do. Thank you to Orlo for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. You've heard me talking about Orlo Nutrition for months now. Their polar omega-3s are these Icelandic algae supplements that are algae-based and vegan. They go straight to the original source because fish get their omega-3s um, and DHA from algae. So we're starting there. You get three times the nutrition there. They're absorbed three times better than fish oils using 99% less resources um, that's also taking care of marine life. We are protecting those sensitive ecosystems that are giving nature a chance to heal and regenerate. Um, and these are carbon negative. These polar omega threes are um, their processing that they use to make them sequesters carbon, which means takes it out of the atmosphere, which is amazing. And finally, they have a reusable bottle so you can keep getting your refills, fill it up and take more ecological responsibility. So as a friend of mine, you can get 20% off at allonutrition.com using code TINA. And I want to remind you that omega-3s are a critical thing that runners need. We need them for heart health. We need them for brain health. So especially if you are someone who is really trying to do something special this year with your running and you want to stay focused, you want to stay in the mental game, go get yourself some of these all low omega threes feel good about doing it feel good in your body feel good that you're taking care of the planet while also making sure that you can get the most out of your performance again use code tina at allownutrition.com and you can go check out more there i have loved using these i'm so excited they have built up in my system ready for my 50 mile coming very soon i feel good and you will too again that's allownutrition.com and use code tina <music> What would you say to someone listening who maybe is feeling stuck either within yeah, running that they there's a little voice inside that's saying, I don't know if I want to do this anymore, or even just within their life, within a career path of maybe this, like they've always had hearing you talk about this. They've always wondered if they'd be a good real estate agent, but never had the courage to shift. What would you say to that person? Um, I mean, always try it not to feel stuck even if you feel it's okay at least you try it i think there was always like that feeling you get where always wanting to do something but then don't have the courage to do it but also like friends and family like if i didn't have like friends and family that like say you could do it i, I believe it's not like i can just go do all this thing by myself like not having anybody to believe you you definitely need like people good people in your corner to believe you but it is up to you to start it's like that mm -hmm. loved one and, um, and the family, like whatever, they're not going to start it for you, but I think just do it. And then if it doesn't work, maybe you find out you like something else. It just didn't work out. So, I mean, the worst thing is like, when you're still like breathing and leaving and you're just afraid to try something because also who cares if you felt, you don't have to announce it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah. I just think like, just go for it and, and if it's running and you're struggling with running and there's no joy in running, that's because you're probably focusing too much on running. Find something else to do so you can put your energy um, towards. Um, and I actually started getting involved in the Big Brother, Big Sister program. And I have a little sister now. Like I find time to hang out with her once or twice a month. And I get to just to be like 11 year old more. I mean, I'm more responsible because I'm the one driving and, uh, <laughs> out and, but that's been one of the best thing I've ever been part of. Mm. Yeah. And I love this. I love it so much. And 
I get to see my little sister grow and, and she's bringing so much joy in my life. You never know if I didn't try that, I wouldn't have another person who's like pretty much part of my family and her family. I know her whole family. Her mom is amazing. And for me, I feel like the more people you have around you, the happier you are. So try different things. It doesn't have to be work. You can volunteer. You can try it. You can go hiking instead of running and maybe find other friends who love to hike. It's not always about running, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Have Do you, when you say that, do you, does that mean that you've gone through periods over the last, you know, you said you've been running as a professional athlete uh, for 10, 11 years. You've had times during that way you didn't want to be running, but you kept doing it because you felt like it was your career and what you needed to do and what you were supposed to be doing. Uh, did you have times where you didn't feel like your heart was in it? No, I've, I mean, I was always in it. I'm still in it. I just know what it takes to be competing at that level, you know, year after year, like putting in pretty much all year. It's not like you have your break is like a couple of weeks, but even then you're not, that's not really a break. A, a month is, I mean, some people only take a week for me. I would take a month, a month out of the year. It is a lot. And you know, the level of, you know, being a professional runner in any really sport or being a professional athlete, it takes a lot. And I think that's something you just have to be realistic. I'm not saying I'm like old, but I'm 38 turning 39 this year. And I've been doing this since I was 14. I mean, I would be crazy not to think that at some point my body can't keep doing this. I can't, maybe I won't be able to do something I've done 10 years ago. I know I can't. And people are always like, Oh, you're not that old. Look at Kira, look at Sarah. I'm like, but we had different careers. Like I've had a different life. Like, my life is different from them. Like, yeah, it's inspiring to see that they could so do run really well at that age, but we don't not build the same. We didn't have the same mm-hmm. career path, right? Like some people mm-hmm. took a break. Some people didn't do marathon for years. I've been doing a marathon since 2011 and I would do two to three sometimes a year. Like I know what I put my body through and I know I can't do 120 miles every month, every week. I need to add on yoga. I need to add on some hikes, but just me, I'm realistic that I can't keep pounding and still trying to go run a 223 to 24 marathon. So for me to do that, it's going to take a lot more, you know, close training a lot. I'm going to have to think out, outside of box. And if it doesn't happen, I'm also okay. I've had a good career. I think you have to just be okay with what you've done and also Mm. being okay with trying to find something, something else to do. There's a lot, there's a other life besides running family, um, getting involved in volunteering, something like you can't just keep like thinking, Oh, I've done this. I can, I talked to a lot of runners like, yeah, you know, I've done this thing in a workout. I was like, well, if you're doing that in a workout, you're not doing the races. Then let's not talk about it. It's, nobody cares. You know what I mean? I don't know. Mm. But, mm. but I'm no, so- I think you're right. We definitely, when we're in the running obsession phase, there's so much, it just, it takes over, it can take over your mind Mm -hmm. in every way. And related to that, you, you know, you did say uh, to me in, in the message, one of the messages we were sending back and forth about how um, you don't look back on your races and think, um, Oh, that was my best. You, you think, wow, like I accomplished that. Um, and yes, maybe I can do it again someday, but everything's going to have to line up for me to do so. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about reflecting back and being in, in where you are now when you have had maybe some incredible things that you've been able to do, uh, and you're not there now and finding peace with that. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm hundred percent. I think maybe for me, sometimes I question whether like, am I just getting lazy? I don't. And I was like, am I not believing in myself? Because I'm also, I'm so at peace that if I never run fast again, and if running was not, maybe if, I guess if I wasn't traveling and I was just staying at home and I had a nine to five job where I sat on a desk it would be different. But like, I see how like for me, running like really is like has done a lot of different, like 
for me, it's like running, like changed my life where I went from like living in a village, not knowing I would ever finish high school to pretty much going to living in Canada. And of course I had to do a lot of sacrifices, like not seeing my family, but I'm also pe- at peace with that because that's what I needed to do. I'm not going to go back and regret not seeing my family and be sad and be depressed. But I think for me, I see what running has done for me, where I am, where my family is, where I am in terms of like the, the person I want to be, the woman I want to be. I'm at peace because I'm here because of running and then the every other, and like the family, the people that supported me. And I'm okay with that. I really am. And I can do, like I said, I can do other things as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that you're able to, to have that view. Um, and you've brought it back a lot to family. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So maybe talk to us a bit about that in terms of, do you see, do you see in your, um, in your life as a runner with other people that maybe there isn't an, a strong enough connection to family that we should be doing more to like reconnect to support. I mean, as someone who also is away from their family, like mm-hmm. I, I recognize that, um, you know, I'm same as you, I'm, I, although you got your brother there, um, I've got my family far away, but I probably could be doing more to support them even from here. But yeah, let's talk about, about that element of it, um, in terms of, yeah, being there for our family, in even if it um, affects our running a little bit. Yeah, because then, like, they always said, like, you know, life is short. Yeah, life is short. Like, but also, I feel like it would be hard to even be a really, like, if you're a really good runner, but you didn't have people in your corner, like, to celebrate with it. And, I mean, I I hear people saying, oh, I don't have anybody to talk to. Um, I don't have, like, family or friends. Like it's always, it always makes me sad because I feel like that's the best part. Like I, for me over the years, I've always like worked really hard because I also knew it wasn't just me. It was like supporting my family, like helping them, whether me being able to fly this in my family, it's not just like giving them money, helping them financially. It's like, of course, that's also part of it. Or you can, you could be there for your family in like so many different ways. Um, I would be really sad if I could never come and see my brother and his kids and wife. And, or if I couldn't go over the Christmas, I actually went to Canada and spend Mm -hmm. Christmas with my two sisters and my brother-in-law. And, Mm -hmm. but you know, that requires like time, money, uh, flexible with your job. And I have, I'm able to do that. So to me, that is part of the success. And then that success came from running so I think like for me, that's really important. And sometimes I'll be like, I'm going to train really hard and go to this race and maybe get a parent's money or prize money so that I can use that money to either save it or go to my family, enjoy, we can eat and drink and uh, just do the things we always dream of when we were young or we never dream of. Mm-hmm. But it's like kind of seeing where we are now because we all have different paths. We have different careers it's nice to see also a family that is very successful in their own way. And I think that's more fun because we all bring something to the table and we all now working It has nothing to do with how much money you have, but now we can meet at like a different location, right? Like for example, in 2017, I ran New York city marathon and I went straight to Rwanda and we had a family reunion. It was my mom and my seven siblings and we stayed there for 10 days. I mean, that's, Mm. that's better to me that's bigger than winning gold medal at the olympics you know what i mean because you're with the people you yeah. love people you grew up with yeah yeah i love that yeah and was that something that you planned as a celebration uh kind of around that race or was that just it just happened to line up nicely that you could go straight there from from this big race oh i planned it i planned um, it, it's, it's always nice, you know, for marathons, like, you know, three, four months, you know, ahead of time, what you're getting in terms of like, mm-hmm. giving some money and I'm not a spender, but like when it comes to my family, I feel like that to me is worth it. And I never really, yeah. um, or just being able to go out get dinner with a friend or 
going on a vacation with friends, I always feel like that's always worth it. Of course, you got to be realistic. You can't just like overspend. But I knew what I was getting from New York and I've been having like a, a really good two years. So I had a plan like the Airbnb ahead of time and mm-hmm. my mom and my sister and having, because that was the first time we're together since I left, all of us, since 2000. So That's special. Yeah. And then my brother was actually, um, I think at that time he was living in Alana, Georgia, and my mom hadn't seen um, him in like years. So we also planned like a surprise because she didn't know he was coming. And that was the most stressful. Mm-hmm. I'm never doing that again. Keeping a secret for a couple <laughs> of days. So, yeah. So I planned that ahead of time. And since it was like, you know, it's far away, but I plan it days on New York. It was perfect because I don't have to run and I can just enjoy family time. And I, yeah, it was just convenient. And also it was perfect because Rwanda is only like a 30 minute flight from Burundi. So it was just, just convenient and perfect for all of us. Oh, that's so, so good to have. And, and I bet that meant so much to, you know, all those years your mum had, I mean, obviously along the way she knew you were doing okay, but getting to see it come full circle, um, and especially you coming from a race, getting to see how that worked out and then having everyone back together, that must have been really special. And the crazy thing too about when we were on that vacation, I don't even think I ever talked about, it's it's just like a different culture. Like I never even talked about New York. My brother actually came to watch me, but I never talked Mm -hmm. about New York. Well, well, then nobody was like, how fast did you run? Like, what places did you get? No, I don't even think it, any of my siblings asked me that, which is like, that's like, I think when you travel and you come from a different, also, you know, country or different culture, things are so different. And imagine I just went from New York to basically to see my family, even though that's like the funds that we use, like nobody ever asked me how to, how did you do? Which is so nice because that's where we get asked all the time. <laughs> yeah. So does that drive you a little bit crazy when you are surrounded by like in the, that was one thing I really struggled with. And I do remember from that day at Bix was just the conversation was not really around running. It was very like light and fun. And I remember we were all laughing a lot. Uh, do you get frustrated with that or when you are in these immersed in like New York marathon weekend is a good example you're immersed in these situations where all anyone wants to talk about is running and uh, like forget the rest of who you are for the weekend. Yeah, that's, I think I really struggle with that. And also with a lot of our friends, that, you know, Flagstaff, there's a lot of professional runners that live in Flagstaff. I, some of the, sometimes we go for it, I say dinner or happy hour. And I leave that place after two hours. Like my head is just pounding because one or two people decide to talk about running and their workouts. And I just want, I'm not even making this up at that point. I'm not even enjoying my glass of wine. I get home. I'm like, I'm not doing this again. And I just, I can't, <laughs> it is, it's a lot. Just think about it. we're running every single day, right? Sometimes twice a day. The last thing I want to talk about is my splits. Um, I get it. Like you ask, when is your next race? Because just to start a conversation, because that's what we do. But you don't hear like people are happy. I was talking about their, um, who they open, like how many patients they had, um, how many clients <laughs> they have, uh, how many, it's crazy. Cause it's always like yeah. being also aware, like it's the same, like your mom, I'm sure if you went to happy hour and all you talked about was your kids and you talked about being a parent, nobody, there's going to be very few people that want to be around you. Right. I think it's just knowing when to turn it off. And just being aware, like so those social cues is like, I don't want to talk about running. I want to joke about other stuff. Like I want to make fun of running. Maybe that's more fun. <laughs> I am with you. I, I, I really struggled with that as well. Just, um, it just felt so intense and so like suffocating in many ways. And, uh, yeah, I love now that I, I mean, people still bring up running a lot to me because they think that's what I want to talk about. And I'm sure that's the same with you. Um, But I really love that. So one of my friends was over the other day and he was in the backyard and uh, with my kids. And he said, let's he's like, can I teach them to do a cartwheel? And I was like, sure. 
And I was like, when was the last time I did a cartwheel? And it was just mm -hmm. that kind of pure fun, like thing that in my past, I wouldn't have, have thought about. And, and I just, yeah, really love surrounding myself with people who don't think about running all the time, who see it, if they even do it at all as mm -hmm. a something they do for a few hours and then they have the rest of their life, the rest of who they are. Um, and, um, you know, I think that's where you and I have really kind of, um, felt that mutual understanding over the last few years is because of that, because it's not all about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, yeah, if life feels so much more balanced that way, when it is something you do, but not every thought mm -hmm. going through your head is how is this affecting it? Yeah, and I think like just even being aware that talking about it is not, I mean, I'm just, I shouldn't say it's, it's not okay, but it's more like there's there's no good that comes out if you're just telling me like the times you did in your temple. And sometimes when I say, oh, I did this, and then you get excited and you might mention it because you do what I do. And if I told you, oh, I did 10 miles, 520, and then I go to race and I, I run really well, you'd be like, that makes sense, right? You put... <laughs> you know, it together and then we can move on from that and it's I don't know I just I always I feel like that's why maybe running is not as and people are really intimidated by like runners right because the, the everyday people that just want to exercise and go to marathons and like mm. eat and off and find friends are runners and just to just stay motivated to stay fit and I think because I get these questions like oh my gosh you run so fast. I'm like, so I'm like, I'm so slow compared to you, but I, I'm always thinking, oh, why do people just automatically think oh, I just want to, they, they're like, oh, you're just so amazing. I get so embarrassed when I hear people giving me all these compliments and I'm like, no, I'm not. I just happen to be good at it. And I work hard yes. and you work hard, but you also have a job and, but I don't, I can do a little bit more. And I'm also naturally talented. Like, there are so many different, you know, like it's crazy. There's so much there. Yeah. And it's, it's hard for people to wrap their heads around like how much the talent and the years of training stack up on each other mm -hmm. so that like you or I could not run for five years, not a step mm -hmm. and probably still run 20 minutes in a 5k. Mm -hmm. Just off nothing yeah. and but then there's you know that but that's just that that's just the gift and it doesn't mean that it, if you didn't run for five years and you then were trying to break 30 minutes for someone else that, that that's anything less than valid it's just when you're someone that has that ability has had those years of training it's just a, a bonus and yeah. um yeah. It comes easy too. And I think like if people they're known like, you know, professional, whatever like you wanna call uh, us, but if they just wanna run to like feel good and see what their bodies can do without being like, Oh, I ran this you know, this fast and it's nice to see that you're improving. Like for example, my brother started running like probably six or seven years ago when he came mm -hmm. to America. He was like just so out of shape and he would go to the gym, but it wasn't the same. But like once he figured he could start with two miles and now he can run up to eight miles and he loves it so much. He does not miss a day to me. Like I look at him like, wow, like it's amazing. Like what you could do when you're doing something just because you know, like what it brings to you. Like he tells me how he goes out running and he like the nature just alone and going up and down mm -hmm. the grass and the sweat. And like, it's like therapeutic to him, but he, he found all the good parts of running. Right. And then he apply into his life and then he met his other job, I mean, his job better. He has a better relationship with people. He has better understanding how being physically active can really change your whole life and how you view people, the conversation, you know, a lot more, I think, mm -hmm. like sharp. You meet a lot of different people, come from different backgrounds, have different jobs. And I think it helps a lot when you use it the right way. So true. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and for, you know, reminding of, us of this. Is there anything else you want to share with the listeners today that we haven't um, 
yeah, any parting message you want to give to people? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously I talk a lot. <laughs> um, no, I love it. I think like for me, I feel it's not like, I think like it's okay not to be good at something, but it also it's okay to just like not compare yourself. And I'm not saying it's easy not to compare yourself because sometimes I definitely found myself doing that, especially when I was younger, because you look what people are doing. You're like, why can I do it? I'm not saying that's comparing yourself, but also when you start seeing now is like, so-and-so ran this fast, I can do it. And you start doing sometimes unhealthy things to get there mm-hmm. because you all know, like I said, I think I talked about this earlier that, I don't know the path that person took. I don't know. We have different like genetics, right? We have different talent. We have different backgrounds. I feel like it's always hard to wanting to do what so-and-so is doing, especially when you're not, even if you were twins, probably would be different, right? So I always think like, it's okay to just like not compare yourself. Don't compare yourself and also take, responsibility like and accountability like you can't you know you can't be like a victim all the time i don't know like oh is it like oh like my coach did this it can't just be a coach it has to be like you and your coach and maybe you fell for something that you shouldn't have or been there done that but i think it's okay to be like you know what i've done that i messed up and maybe it wasn't me but it's okay it's okay actually to also forgive and forgive yeah. yourself yeah. and know that it's okay. Like running doesn't find you. Your job doesn't find you. But I feel like over the last 20 some years, like if it wasn't for the people that I met through running that became also my family, like that's like my coaches, my teammates and some I obviously don't keep touch with, but if it wasn't for them, I don't think I would be what I am. If it wasn't for my family, I wouldn't be what I am. I feel like it really takes like a village, like they say. And I always try to be there for people too when I can. And I can always do better. But I just want to be there for people like the people who help me, like my coaches, my friends and stuff. And I think like if you surround yourself with people who are good, who are going to support you and then create relationship, better relationship with your family, with your mom and dad, whatever, whoever that is, I feel like you're always going to be happy. I've never seen people who are alone who are that happy. I mean, how can you be happy? You know? That's such a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that. And and you're right, there is so much now that we, I guess, if, you know, what I'm interpreting this correctly is like, yeah, we we have a role to play and we have a our responsibility, our accountability for every thing that occurs in our life, positive and negative. But also these things are part of our journey. They're part of our path. They're part of um, our learning of who we are and what we want, what we don't want, what who we want to be. Mm-hmm. And we need to get better at, at accepting our role in that, not just saying well, this ha- happened to me and I had no say in the matter. Yeah. And then also being able to like move on, like mm-hmm. being able to like, I mean, we've all had like a lot of things happening like in our lives and some are worse than the others. But like, if I like, like the way I grew up, like my mom was very strict. If I thought about every little thing that I don't know, like I've done and then how maybe like and some punishment or if somebody, if I thought about my neighbor who said something mean to me and I just ha- held on to that for all these years, I will not go anywhere. It's the same with everything. It's like being able to like, and sometimes of course I hold, I hold grudges. Like I would say someone so like, oh, 10 years ago, that person said that. But it's like, I'm thinking, why am I even thinking that way? So like, yeah. you just keep holding on like, Oh, this happened to me and my like, tragedy after tragedy. It's kind of like, man, like you're pretty much like, you're like putting yourself in prison. It's crazy. And like, it's amazing too. And that comes with the age too. That comes with the age. Like yeah. 
I used to hold on to so many different things and now like or worry so much about your like, you know, the people that you support. For me, if I can support you, I do it because I want to, not because I don't want anything in return. Mm-hmm. So if I can't support you, you're not my problem. First of all, I don't have kids. So like I ha- am not responsible for anybody. I'm not responsible even for and I'm not responsible for my mom, but like she's my mom, I'll do whatever I can. But mm-hmm. even a sibling, even someone like if you can't do if you're not capable of doing something or support that person. Why stress yourself? And I tell my friends this. And I used to stress about my family because I felt some guilt because I left yeah. early, right? When I was young. And I was always like, oh, if I hear, oh, one of my siblings is sick because I was so far away and didn't see them. And I would just be like stressing about it and then thinking about them, but I can't be there. They're like 30 hours away by plane. And then the moment I decided, I'm like, you know what? I can't control what my siblings are doing. I can control how responsible and responsible they are. So I had, honestly, it was like things have gone so much better. And I think I decided to do this about eight years ago. After. Oh, that's quite impressive. Yeah. And okay. it's, <laughs> it was early, but also it was like, after I actually was like married and got divorced, I moved and I realized, I'm like, man, I just went through all of that. And yeah, I had people who were there for me, but that was all on me. That was my, like, whatever happened, it was between me and my ex, but I had to be the one that to get out of it. Because people always tell you, oh, try to make it work or in anything, really. People always mm-hmm. try to like, mm-hmm. tell you what you should do, but it's like, but it's on you though. So the same way I realized I'm not responsible for anybody. And then I was, I was responsible for that. And that was like very traumatic at that point because divorce was a taboo and people were always like I was worried about what so and so gonna think and then when I decided to do that I'm like I'm on my own I'm not responsible for anybody and now I've been so much happier ever since (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah I love that and um thank you for sharing that that's obviously like a personal part of your life and um you know it can be difficult to talk about but I appreciate you sharing and, and the message there is is very important as well I want to thank you for joining me today. I loved this extra time getting to know you and and look forward to continuing to follow along with whatever, wherever your joy takes you, wherever um, your journey goes next. So thank you so much for joining today. Well, thank you for having me. I hope um, you, your running keeps getting better and you keep enjoying it. And um, I think we, we talked like uh, on the phone uh, was it a couple of weeks ago when you were telling me that Mm-hmm. the pressure that people are saying this is a perfect age there's no such a thing as a perfect age like of the you know running fast at the breakthrough i mean you take care of yourself take care of your family and just enjoy it like don't listen to anybody. the running for real podcast and everything we do here at running for real would not be possible if it wasn't for the running for real team While I am the person who you hear from most often and maybe the face of the brand, the rest of our team are such critical pieces of what we do. And without them, I think I'd just be running around in circles with ideas. So I want to take a moment to thank our team. To Jeremy Nessel, who's been with me since the very beginning. Kat McKay, Sally Pontarelli, Kelsey Wang, Sandy Gutierrez, Louise Murphy, Andrew Basola, Alexandria Will and Maria Vargas. Thank you to each and every one of you for all that you give to Running For Real and our community. I appreciate you and I'm so thankful for having you as a part of the team. I so appreciate Diane for what she shared there and just her relentlessness of being herself, speaking up for what she feels is important and just the messages that she gave across there. Um, Not only that there's more to life than running, that we can still care about running and also care about other things, but also that she, as she said, that we need to be better at not just kind of being the victim all the time, which is so true. You can find links to follow Diane and get other things we talked about in this episode by going to runningforreal.com forward slash episode 346. I also want to thank our sponsors. You can find links to those in the, in the show notes. You can go to allonutrition.com and use code TINA for 20% off. the up, We have up that code 20% off everything at Orlo. You can also go to Athletic Greens and go to athleticgreens.com forward slash TINA to get that one year free supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 
and five free travel packs. And can I just let you know, if you sign up now, you will be getting a special little bonus, let's say sometime towards the uh, middle point of the year, if you catch my drift. So go sign up now if you've been thinking about it. And also to Allbirds, thank you to Allbirds for sponsoring this episode. You can get a free pair of socks with your order when you add a a pair of socks to your cart when you use the link in the show notes. You can go to runningforreal.com forward slash episode 346. Remember to go check out those for real episodes coming out on Wednesdays. We do have our together runs on Mondays. So subscribe on this feed if you are not already. And I will see you next week. (laughs) 